Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charlie Brock. I'm the Associate Curator of American Paintings here at the gallery. And it's my pleasure and honor to introduce a good friend of mine, Randy Griffey. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Randy's uh, uh, history. Uh, Dr. Griffey began his curatorial career in Kansas City as assistant and then Associate Curator of American Art at the Nelson Atkins Museum from 1999 to 2008. From 2008 to 2012, he served as Curator of American Art at the Mead Art Museum at Amherst College. Griffey was appointed to his current position as Associate Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Metropolitan Museum in 2013. One of his first accomplishments at the Met was the installation of America Today, Thomas Hart Benton's 10 panel 1930 mural for the New School for Social Research. In January 2015, Randy brought his Americanist perspective to reimagining modernism, 1900 to 1950, a widely praised reconfiguration of the Met's collections, highlighting transatlantic links between a European and American modernism. Over the course of his career, Dr. Griffey has evinced an enduring interest in the art of Marsden Hartley. Hartley was the subject of his dissertation at the University of Kansas in 1999, entitled Marsden Hartley's Late Paintings, American Masculinity and National Identity in the 1930s and 40s. Griffey also contributed an essay encoding the homoerotic, Marsden Hartley's late figure paintings to the catalog of the major Hartley retrospective organized by the Wadsworth Athenaeum in 2002. In 2008, his article for American Art, Marsden Hartley's Arianism, Eugenics in the Finnish Yankee Sauna, was honored by the Association of Art Museum Curators as the outstanding journal article of the year. The title of Dr. Griff Griffey's talk today, Marsden Hartley's Maine, is taken from an exhibition that he is currently organizing, which will open at the Met this March before traveling to the Colby College Museum of Art in July 2017. Among the works that will be featured in the show is the National Gallery of Art's 1908 Oil by Hartley Maine Woods, a striking detail of which graces the back cover of the brochure for today's symposium. Please welcome Randy Griffey. Thank you, Charlie. The opening slide works so well with your opening remarks, I have to say. Um, I uh, want to start with a few thank yous. I want to, um, of course, thank, you, thank the National Gallery for the invitation to participate today and to extend congratulations on the glorious renovation and reopening of the East Building. Uh, we're all very excited um, for, for, this, for this occasion. I want to exchange, extend, ex, um, extend thanks also for, uh, to the Walton Family Foundation for sponsoring this afternoon's uh, proceedings. It's a tremendous honor to be included on the roster with these scholars whose work I respect so much, uh, to honor John, who is, as we all know, a titan of the field of American art. Um, as you know, a, a few of today's speakers had the privilege of, of having John as a, of, of a professor, or as a professor. I personally did not have that particular um, privilege, though in a way, I'd like to think that we're all his students for his voluminous and important publications. Uh, so I'll share with you today the introduction to a show I'm co-curating with colleagues Donna Cassidy from the University of Southern Maine and Beth Finch at the Colby College Museum of Art, who I suspect are tuning in online. I, okay. um, and uh, and uh, with whom I co-wrote the essay you're about to hear, or at least part of uh, you're about to hear. Um, and as you can see the opening slide, the, the show opening at Met Breuer in the mid-March into early summer, and then we send Hartley home to Maine for the summer and through the fall. And the show, of course, focuses on a topic that is near and dear to John's heart, which is Maine and Hartley's uh, lifelong artistic engagement with his home state. Marston Hartley's life made a full circle before its close, wrote Elizabeth McCausland in the opening of her seminal 1952 monograph on the artist. This circle was inscribed around Maine. Hartley was born in the mill town of Lewiston in 1877 and died in the down east coastal town of Ellsworth in 1943. Here's downtown Maine, or sorry, downtown Lewiston and one of the family residences during Hartley's childhood. 
At his request, his ashes were scattered in the state's storied Androscoggin River, the waterway after which he named a collection of poems he published about three years before his death. Hartley began his professional career in the first decades of the 20th century by creating lush, dazzling landscapes of his home state's western hills and concluded it by presenting himself, beginning in 1937, as the painter from Maine and making roughly rendered paintings of and publishing related poetry and prose about Maine's rugged landscape, coastal terrain, and working class folk. And here's actually the full view of the National Gallery's beautiful 1908 uh, work that they're generously lending to the show uh, that Charlie mentioned in his opening remarks. While Hartley made only short trips back in 1917 and 1928, he felt that Maine was with him both as a point of reference and as a concept throughout his many travels across Europe and North America. Marston Hartley's Maine considers the artist's complex, sometimes contradictory, relationship with his native state and how it is reflected in his work. Hartley explored what was both exhilarating and what was desolate in Maine, finding there both light and darkness. And here, these two poles of light and darkness are, I think, beautifully, profoundly exemplified by two loans uh, from the Crystal Bridges uh, Museum of American Art that they're generously extending to the show. Having suffered from a lonely childhood and stung by the devastating loss of his mother at the age of eight, Hartley sought to distance himself from his home state as a marker of heritage for many years. Writing from Bermuda in February of 1917 to his dealer, photographer, and gallery owner Alfred Stieglitz, he chafed at critic Henry McBride's characterization of him as a Yankee in a review of Hartley's Berlin paintings. The quote was from McBride, this Hartley is a lean intellectual dissolution type, McBride wrote in the New York Sun, continuing, very American. So American that it is fair to guess that he is a Yankee. In response to Stieglitz, Hartley retorted, I come as near being a man of no land as anyone I know, spiritually speaking. The artist homosexually Homosexuality alluded to in his personal correspondence and conveyed in poignant coded terms in some of his greatest works contributed to an ingrained sense of isolation that could be only partially dispelled by chosen friendships and alliances. Leaving Maine in 1893 to join his family in Cleveland, Ohio, Hartley began his art education in that city. He moved to New York in the fall of 1899 and spent the following summer in Maine, establishing a pattern of living and working between his home state and New York or Boston. In New York in April of 1909, Hartley met Stieglitz, who would become not only his dealer, but also his confidant and counselor throughout much of his career. Stieglitz immediately recognized Hartley's unique voice, writing in one letter, I believed in you and felt, your, felt in your work I felt, it, I believed in you and your work. I felt, I, li I felt a spirit I liked. And the very next month exhibited a selection of the main landscapes at his little galleries of the photo succession at 291 Fifth Avenue. Hartley also had another solo show at the gallery in the winter of, of uh, uh, 1912. And in April he left for New York, left New York for his first trip to the modern, modernist art capitals of Europe, Paris and Berlin. He returned briefly to New York in late 1913 to exhibit, again at 291, his earliest European works. Back in Germany in the spring of 1914, he remained there until wartime conditions forced him to return to the United States in the winter of 1915. So it's from that period, uh, his return to um, the US to New York in 1915, that for the next 10 years or more, Hartley's itinerary is nearly impossible to track. He um, sets about what is, becomes known as his, very well known as his kind of peripatetic nature. He traveled extensively throughout the late 19 teens and into the 1920s, but in correspondence, he frequently reflected on Maine uh, throughout these many travels and, dr and drew many analogies between the place in which he resided at any particular time and his native 
his, his home state. So in the interest of time, we won't recount his, uh, his full itinerary, um, but rather move ahead. In 1926 and again in 1927, he painted in Aix-en-Provence in an artistic communion with Paul Cézanne, in an experience that bore fruit not only in his paintings of Mont saint pétroire one of which you see here, a site immortalized by the French post-impressionist artist, but also more subtly and more profoundly in his later depictions of Maine's Mount Katahdin. And there he is in Aix-en-Provence. The emotional toll of his peripatetic life began to weigh down on Hartley when, as he confided into Stieg to Stieglitz in December of 1926, he began to feel, and I quote, he began to feel the need of finding an actual spiritual pierre de terre. I, wanted, I want so earnestly a place to be. External pressures also began to define his personal and professional relationship with his homeland. Chief among these was the belief prevalent throughout the 1920s and into the 1930s that the creation of great American art was predicated on an artist's rootedness in his or her native culture. And there you see Hartley in the south of France. Hartley's continued distance and perceived disconnectedness from the United States with his travels to Mexico, Germany, and Nova Scotia in the early 1930s con contributed, in fact, to a growing and eventual, eventually irreconcilable rift with Stieglitz. Hartley transformed American modernism by approaching his place of origin as a creative as a lifelong creative resource. But the, but the narrative of a triumphant late life return was only part of the story. Fundamentally, the state offered the inspiration of nature as an alluring subject, as it had for many earlier American artists, most famously Winslow Homer, whose precedent as a painter of Maine, Hartley was acutely aware. Hartley particularly responded to Homer's legacy in the wake of the Homer centenary, centenary uh, centennial in 1936, and it, so it's not, coinc it's not an accident that the very next year, 1937, Hartley says, I'm the painter from Maine. Um, and I, this gives me an opportunity also to mention that the Mets installation of the show will include a few works from across the Mets collection that come to bear on Hart Hartley's career and the trajectory of his artistic vision, including this great nor'easter by uh, Homer, uh, the, one of the great Prout, late Proutsneck pictures in the American wing which will be uh, adjacent to Hartley's beautiful paintings of the coast. Hartley's early main landscapes of the Western Hills overlap in contrast with Homer's coastal views, and his later work is in dialogue with that of many other artists in Maine, both native-born and transplants, among them John Marin, Edward Hopper, painters of the Ogunquit and Monhegan art colonies, and those who produced, in fact, those who produced uh, New Deal post office murals. For Hartley, Maine's landscape served as a slate onto which to, to pursue new ideas and theories pertaining to formal elements of art and of color and design. In his main landscapes of 1908 to 1911, he experimented with abstracting from nature and established compositional devices that would recur throughout his work. Consider, for instance, the many similarities connect, connecting Carnival of Autumn of 1908 and Mount Katahdin, Autumn Number no. 2 from 1939-1940. This, the work on the right is in the Met's collection. And both present their respective landscape subjects in flattened hieratic, hieratic arrangements composed in tiers, lake, lake and foothills, mountain, which appears well above the composition center point, and a narrow band of blue sky filled with white clouds. Furthermore, the sublimity of the landscape suggested to Hartley the presence of a higher power, one that he was predisposed to understand through the lens of Mer American transcendentalism after his exposure to Emerson's essays as a young man. Maine's dramatic change in seasons led Hartley to make landscapes in series, sustained meditations on the passage of time, and the inherent tension between temporality and permanence, uh, dramatically exemplified in the, the Katahdin series, which is four works of which you see here. His paintings of the tempestuous coastlines are imbued with pain, loss, and alienation, themes that course through his life as they give power to his art. 
Maine's lumberjacks, loggers, farmers, and hunters appear in both the early and the late work, although admittedly not exactly in the same guise, <laughs> or the same activities. Also, Hartley's Maine includes absences and omissions. He, he painted the inland mountains and the coast, as well as the people of these regions, but his Maine remains mostly untouched by industrialization. Power lines and highways appear nowhere in his paintings. Paintings of woodlots and log drives allude to the lumber industry with dramatic views of nature, touched by workers, but no sign of the mills. The main paintings brought Hartley success late in his career. In the 1930s, when artistic identification with place, with place was tantamount to cultural significance, Hartley understood Maine to be essential in gaining recognition as a great American artist, recognition he achieved just before his death. And here's one of many positive reviews, glowing reviews he earned throughout the last two or three years of his life in this uh, review from the New York Times, which you can see I've highlighted from DeVries, do the shows of, uh, of any either painter in America leave the viewer with such a sense of discovery and excitement as those of Marston Hartley? Until this shift in fortunes, he endured what were best uneven reviews for much of his nearly 40-year career. He seeming, his seemingly unfocused engagement with post-impressionism, cubism, expressionism, symbolism, and various realist idioms struck many critics and others in the know as evidence of a painter grasping for direction, not a painter with a unique vision and in command of his own artistic voice. The course of Hartley's career began to change in 1937 when he declared himself the painter from Maine. And during the last five years or so of his life, his reputation grew among critics and lay audiences alike. His work earned critical praise, received awards, and entered prominent private and public collections, including those of Washington, D.C. collector Duncan Phillips and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Such was Hartley's stature and self-confidence in late 1942, only weeks before his death, that he could write to his niece and confidant, Norma Berger, I have a high position as a painter, as high as anyone. When I am no longer here, my name will register forever in the history of American art. Long gone is the East seat in, in uh, Stieglitz's earlier photograph. As predicted, his name does register prominently in art history, but not for the reasons he might have imagined in 1942. For much of the late 20th century, his reputation, reputation rested not on his, his late work or the early exper experimental landscapes of Maine, but rather on the abstract paintings he made in Berlin between 1913 and 1915, when he was in the mix of European avant-garde artists, Picasso and Kandinsky, not least among them. Portrait of a German officer, shown here, a composition that draws an equal measure from synthetic cubism and expressionism, became a mainstay in textbooks on modern art and exemplified the abstract work through which Hartley became to be, came to be known by museum goers and students of art history. Until recent years, critical and scholarly praise of Hartley's German period frequently came at the expense of his later work, including the late main lane man landscapes that had bolstered his reputation in the 1930s and 40s. This bias is particularly pronounced in William and S. Homer's 1977 study of the Stieglitz Circle, an excerpt we see here, where uh, Homer says, at the closing of 291 Stieglitz's gallery in 1917, he continued, Hartley's art lacked the definite direction it had shown in Germany in 1913-1915. In retrospect, these seemed to, to be the most important years of his career. When Hartley was forced to abandon the, the congenial creative ambiance of Berlin, his style faltered. His most important period was over. So Hartley registered prominently histories of modernism would tell us, if briefly, in, in modern art history, as an important member of the American avant-garde, but his work outside this specific context was thought to be less worthy of serious consideration and effectively disappeared into near obscurity. 
Critic Karen Wilkin identified this imbalance when, in 1988, she observed, quote, and I quote, Marston Hartley is one of our best painters, but not long ago he could have been described as an enigmatic presence in the history of our country's art. Not that he was unrecognized, quite the contrary, but he was known for only a fraction of his work. Wider understanding of Hartley's complex career has been predicated on and symptomatic of the weakening influence of the formalist critical paradigm that held sway throughout much of the mid and late 20th century, one that underpinned Homer's 1977 assessment. Most famously articulated and, pro uh, and promoted by the Marxist critic Clement Greenberg, this ideology favored abstraction and compositional flatness over all representational forms and idioms. For Greenberg, a work of art was either avant-garde or it was kitsch. With the latter connoting representational painting with recognizable subject matter and narrative, which the critic associated with spurious capitalism and a myopic, even potentially dangerous, cultural nationalism. Among other wide-ranging effects, Greenbergian formalism drained American scene painting and regionalism of the 1930s of cultural value. Because Hartley's ma main work related to both of these movements, the leaf bearing his name in Ad Reinhardt's Arboreal Genealogy of Modern Art in 1947, which you see here, a mere three years after Hartley's death, appears on a branch breaking under the weight of subject matter. So just to make sure you can see the breakout here. Um, so so uh, this, is a, this is the detail and the red box here. And then the red box here shows Hartley's leaf, which is on the damning, uh, you know, the ill-fated branch breaking under, <laughs> under subject matter. I also love that, like, winning a prize is a bad thing. <laughs> but <laughs> thrilling a prize really weighs you down. Uh, this is one of the beautiful uh, pictures from the Colby College collection that will be featured in the show. Uh, one of the gifts from Alex Katz, who is a big Hartley fan. Uh, Hartley enjoys quite a lot of appreciation of contemporary painters like Katz and others. However, despite all of this, a few contrarian critics and scholars, particularly those writing for popular or non-specialist contexts and journals, advocated for the aesthetic and cultural merit of Hartley's late main work. Among the most vocal supporters of this part of Hartley's career was Robert M. Coates, reviewer for The New, York, for the New Yorker, who, cut, who cutting remarkably against the dominant grain of contemporary art criticism in 1960, wrote in The New Yorker, it wasn't until Hartley settled on Maine as his particular province that he reached his true stature. I don't know what it is about Maine, dour, rugged, remote, its people cantankerous, and its climate barbarous, that not only attracts the artist, but incites him onto the fullest development of his powers. It would have been music to Hartley's ears had he been alive to hear it. The great sea change in Hartley studies can be traced to the 1980 retrospective mounted by the Whitney Museum of American Art, which prompted its many visitors to consider more seriously other dimensions of the painter's career beyond the renowned German period. The Hartley retrospective laid the foundation for a more expansive study of Hartley's career that has followed. And I'll make the point here, which you see an installation view of that seminal retrospective in 1980, is that it's, for me, very poignant that um, the Met and the Colby's Hartley show will actually be in the Breuer building where this retrospective took place. Um, and since the 1980 Whitney retrospective, Hartley studies have flourished with abundant publications and exhibitions addressing new and far-ranging aspects of his life and career, including his sexuality, race and ethnicity in his work, and his travels beyond the early German period. And another retrospective followed in 2003-2004, and uh, which brought sort of all these different dimensions of the scholarship together to bear with a multi-author um, traveling, multi-author catalog, which was unprecedented, and the three-venue tour. And um, just a quote here from Roberta Smith, 
hoping to, I guess, stoke the interest in, in the Hartley show coming up, is uh, she begins this wonderful review of Betsy Kornhauser's retrospective uh, organized when Betsy was at the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of American Art in Hartford, is that Marston Hartley is one of the great artists and certainly one of the most intriguing art historical subjects of all time. Who am I to argue with that? <laughs> Marston Hartley's Maine joins recent reevaluations by examining Maine as place and the place of Maine in Hartley's art. It examines the range of Hartley's work in his native region, from the early innovative landscapes, uh, the early paintings of Maine's western hills, to the distinctive paintings on glass done in Ogunquit, and the representations of Maine from abroad to the final paintings of the coast, Mount Katahdin, and local inhabitants, such as this memorable boxer from the Bangor, Maine YMCA. For Hartley, Maine was a lifelong source of inspiration, integrally linked to his personal history, his wider cultural milieu, and his desire to create a new regional expression of American modernism. I hope you'll see it at both venues. Thanks. Thanks.